In this section of the CE, we're going to look at the use of self in practice. And as we go through here, you will find that we're overviewing a lot of what we've already discussed. So there won't be a lot of detail in some of it. But what I'd like for you to do is look at what we discuss here from the lens of how you would use this in terms of self in practice, how you would use these various kinds of things we're going to talk about. And you'll see the use of self in practice text that I showed earlier on the screen and the heart and soul of change, delivering what works in therapy. Both are excellent books that I recommend if you want to further delve into this idea of self in practice and the common core factors, which are really critical uh, in terms of developing that therapeutic alliance. Some of the highlights from the book had to do with looking at self-disclosure as a way to reduce transference when we're working with clients and being more uh, transparent and sharing of uh, selves, your own uh, examples perhaps that you may have experienced. Uh, because either using your own examples or talking about others that you've worked with who have been successful gives people that expectation that it will be a positive outcome. Uh, you certainly want to show examples of people that were successful, not, not people who, had, uh, who were not able to meet whatever the goals were in the therapy. Um, they also interestingly point out, this is in Self and Practice by Michelle, um, uh, Baldwin, he talks about, you know, this idea that Buddhism has an interesting perspective too, and that all we can be uh, assured with in life is change. And many of us have difficulties with change based on control or other issues. So that's an element that's present as well. And the important thing is how you begin your relationship with your client. That's the key thing is the person-centered foundation starts first before moving into the therapeutic work with whatever techniques or methods you may use. The art of, of therapy is the foundation of the common core factors and the science has to do with the evidence-based kinds of materials that we train on and will use in practice. David Keith, who's in one of the last chapters of Michelle Baldwin's book, made this statement about psychotherapy, which I think is, quite uh, um, uh, wise. He said, good psychotherapy produces destabilization and changes that are not just cognitive adjustments, but whole person changes. So again, we, we're dealing with uh, uh, changes. See, change seems to be a theme here in a lot of what we do. And, and Virginia Satir used to ask people, how do you feel a lot? Some people got kind of tired of that, but Satir's uh, focus was, we've got to have people deal with what's going on in the here and now, what's going on. And I think this nicely dovetails into Rosenberg's nonviolent communication, which has to do with helping people work through anger. And what, what he says is if people are yelling and screaming at you out of anger, they're calling for help, which I thought was an interesting perspective. But essentially what he does is he has people describe the situation without judging what happened to them, in other words, their experience, and then beginning to look at what needs they were having that were not being met. What were the unmet needs that were sparking this anger? And then to talk about the feelings and coming to a place where they would ask, you know, would you be willing to do something in regard to the situation with the person or persons that they may have been involved with? This involves some further training, but I suggest that uh, uh, Rosenberg's Nonviolent communication would really be helpful in terms of our practice, in terms of getting people to communicate with each other. So that's kind of our, our intro here in terms of looking at what's going on. Next, I'd like to share with you some of my own use of self and practice uh, examples, which uh, were uh, earlier on, I was in vocational rehab before I became a licensed therapist and I had completed a guidance and counseling degree uh, a master's level degree uh, sometime before that. And in the uh, mental health unit, I chose to take on a mental health caseload because I wanted to understand mental illness and what people's experiences of various diagnostic labels were because we tend to label people. And I think sometimes that can be problematic because when we label, some people just are lazy and go with a previous label. And that comes to kind of a, uh, an issue of um, what I had in terms of my uh, bias, you know, we're talking about biases. I used to initially read people's records that were given to me and they were very biased records. 
not only uh, I was becoming biased, but the people who wrote them were biased. And uh, so it was interesting to see what kinds of diagnostic menus I found in people's charts. I mean, I was shocked. I mean, sometimes I found uh, conflicting diagnoses. <laughs> and so what I finally decided to do was don't read the record before I meet the client. And so my practice was to just meet the person and have them tell their life story to me and however they felt comfortable. And then begin to see how they, and that way we were able to step into their view of the world. Because remember in trauma-informed care, it's not what's wrong with Mary, it's what, you know, what happened to Mary? What was her experience of what was going on? Hearing that, I think, is very important. And some of my clients, I don't think, ever had anyone listen to their story before. It was really interesting to hear their feedback about that. But then I, so that's one, you know, that's one bias we may acquire in practice that we don't have right now. If we've, uh, well, you've got a lot of experience, but I mean, someone that may be coming in new, we, we may find that we're biased by other things, like others' biases of biases from other people that they read. So I, I found that sometimes what I would arrive at in terms of a diagnosis was totally unrelated to what I saw in the listing. And we need to be careful about this because people are labeled for life. And I think going to the least serious diagnosis based on what the DSM offers us to choose from makes more sense. And so making sure that those criteria that are required for the diagnosis are discreetly met for each diagnosis that you would render. And so the listening to the stories was really important because not only when clients tell their story, you're hearing it, but they're hearing it. And hearing yourself tell your story from the client perspective, I think is a very powerful part of the practice of healing. And I think they've been doing that early on in terms of Freud and other people around people with PTSD rather kinds of issues. So, and then of course, narrative therapy has one be able to change the story as an example. And that I think is also important. And then looking at another example in terms of the use of metaphor and artwork, you're going to see on a screen here, three images, which I call Mandela symbols. At the beginning, I was working with an intern at UCF at an aid service organization in Orlando back around the 19, or around 1990 something early. And uh, she, and I had talked about this idea of forgiveness because we, we kind of came to the idea that some people have issues of forgiveness that block them from moving forward. So with some of her clients, she was asking them if there was anyone they wanted to work on forgiveness with. And this middle-aged or kind of 30th to 35 to 40 year old wanted to work on forgiveness of his father. And so we began this kind of, I have an article on the stages of forgiveness and therapy. And in stage three or four, when you're kind of into session four or so, you would have them write a letter, uh, an unsent letter to the person they wanted to forgive. And so in this case, he was to write a letter to his father and the next week there was gonna be this gestalt-like exercise where he reads the letter and engages in the process. So in the interim week, the father called him. He hadn't talked to him in about 20 years, out of the blue, I don't know where he got his phone number. He calls and says, son, I have terminal liver cancer and I'm supposed to die within the next year. I'd like you to come home and take over the farm. I think I may have mentioned this a little earlier but I wanted to show you the mandala images as well that he showed. Well, anyway, he and his father reconciled during that phone conversation. He obviously wasn't gonna go home and take care of the farm. However, this was really, uh, this is what I call therapeutic synchronicity or extra therapeutic factors that happen along when we're working with individuals that we couldn't possibly predict. It was a very meaningful coincidence that he was able to reconcile with his father and that he had intended to work through this. Uh, thank goodness that they didn't have to do the Gestalt uh, exercise the following week because that had been well taken care of. But these images you see up here, what, what happened was in early, uh, in his adolescence, you'll see the picture with the horse in front of the house. She had him do the pictures and I said to her, I said, this looks to me like something happened in the past because you'll see the, where the direction the horse is facing, which essentially is the past. I said, why don't you ask him when you come back next week, what happened here? Because there was a cloud over the house and there were other things. By the way, this is my rendition of his artwork and not his original artwork, because he kept it. But basically I've got the symbols here. So the horse you see is something I took off the internet because I can't do, I'm a stick figure person and the horse wouldn't look like one. But anyway, <laughs> the important aspect here is that he wanted to become an equestrian competitor, uh, Olympic 
equestrian competitor. And when he told that to his father, he said, you can't even ride a horse. What are you talking about? And crushed his, his, uh, his dream. See, I'm, I'm really big about not crushing our clients' dreams or family members, but to try to do something other. So this was really kind of a lifelong thing that got stuck there. And then, of course, when he came out to the family that he was gay, he lived in the Midwest. That was a really negative thing. And he eventually moved to Florida because of that. And so in the middle picture, which is the one you see with him on like a skateboard going through the picture and out of the, out of the circle, that was kind of as he talked about his life. It was very up and down and rough. He had a very difficult life. And now he's at the uh, AIDS service organization because of his diagnosis. And in the last slide or the last mandala, he shows him standing there with the sun, the moon, and some other images. And it's sort of his current existential angst. What is life about? And how can I incorporate that? And so those were issues they were working around. But the critical thing for him at that point was he needed to first forgive his father and deal with his issues in terms of self-forgiveness around those kinds of elements that came through that relationship. Very powerful, but note your uh, extra therapeutic stories that the clients tell you because this synchronicity issue, therapeutic synchronicity is what I call it because you incorporate that in your practice and it's very healing. And sometimes it can jump five sessions ahead and, you know, you might have been able to eliminate several of the other steps that we had in the forgiveness process because he actually did it in midstream. So I think that's an important example. And then the last one that I'll, I'll mention is my secretarial support person in Voc Rehab. I, of course, I work with uh, several therapists who would refer people to, v to, to VR and then we would work together with them. And so there were several transgender individuals who had been referred to my caseload. And this was a 50 year old man who had just begun the transition and called and said, you know, I, I'm transgender and would it be okay if I were addressing a pearl necklace to my interview? And I said, that would be fine with me. I said, I don't have any problem with that. So he arrives to the office and he's in the waiting room. And of course, unfortunately in this office, we had a public address system. So Doris, my secretary, decided to announce his arrival and said something to the effect, George, a man with a dress wearing pearls is waiting to see you in the waiting room. I thought, oh my God, now I have to kind of do, you know, damage control in terms of what Doris just did. And Doris was a church going person, but certainly wasn't aware of her biases. And a lot of times I say this because we may be trying to attend to our own biases in some ways, but then we're working around other people who also have biases. And sometimes their biases can affect our work with clients that, that have been marginalized in our society. So I think sometimes when we do our work, we have other uh, outside kinds of issues coming in that Im impose on us around issues of biases as, as an example. Moving to the idea here of the use of rituals with interns and clients, one example for the intern would be listening to one's intuition before the session where one taps into an intention to have a positive outcome and stepping into the client's worldview. That would be kind of a ritual one would do as they walk toward the session each time or sit down before they log in. So that's an example. And there are ones we can do with our clients. Now, I think what we'll do is move into the area of the use of self and practice from the materials we've done today. And so what you'll see now on the screen between myself and Dr. Bucky is the client-centered elements we've talked about. So I'm not going to go into great detail with some of these, but I want you to look at these from the lens of the use of self and practice. So the use of, of self and psychotherapy, this idea that client-centered focus is critical for the alliance to be built. And advanced listening skills are really critical here because the client feels that they've been listened to. That really builds the therapeutic alliance with the client. And the common core factors that need to be involved with this, which we've looked at before, uh, Dr. Bucky will talk a little bit about them here again. Since we've had a lot of detail on them, she's just gonna go over a review of them. But think of yourself in terms of using these in your practice if you aren't currently already doing it. Correct, and especially if you're supervising interns, which of course is why you're in this course in the beginning, um, the, the presence of being genuine to any client with whom we engage is, in my opinion, essential, and the literature certainly supports that. I think many clients have worked with several intervention specialists, 
whether they carried the title of person in the uh, counseling center in a certain setting, whether they carry the title of psychotherapist. And I think many clients, because they have had some experience prior to us and engaging with us, have learned perhaps to put up their radar and to see really who we are. So the idea of coming into the session with a client who may be across from you or beside you, and just being a human being to that client, listening carefully, acutely to what the client is saying and attempting to engage them in a conversation as a very genuine person who is expressing some interest in who they are and what they have to tell you. So our congruence, I think, is a beginning point that leads us then into that infamous saying that comes from Rogers, unconditional positive regard. George has already alluded to a series of elements and biases that also form prejudgments. And I love the idea too, George, of not reading about the client before you engage with them uh, because of the potential for biases by the former recorder, if nothing else. So as we go into that, giving the client our full attention, unconditional positive regard, which means we take in what they say and what they share without judgment and without their seeing that we are being judgmental, raising our eyebrows or pulling back from them, whatever. And I often say to uh, students, in fact, that clients are very much like adolescents. They can smell a rat a mile away and they can really tell if you are not being genuine and if you're not interested, if you're just going through the motions which I think that understanding nature then emits from us if we truly are engaged with them. And consequently, it opens us up to what we say and how we approach the client as saying, come, let's collaborate, let's come together and work on issues, problems, distresses that you may have had that brought you into this arrangement today with me. And together, we will do this. And I do believe that so many of the clients that I have worked with in my social work history have actually had people dash their hopes and engage them in a, in a fear mongering almost to allow them to question themselves, who they are and what they can do. George has already given some examples. So there always must, always must be an element of hope that we engage our clients with and that we leave them with until the next session. Next, we, uh, now again, these are, we're looking at these from a couple of lenses because this is usually, this is about the supervisor's use of self in practice, but also modeling this is for the intern. So this is kind of like this parallel process. It's always at play when we're, when we're discussing this, but you know, trauma-informed care again, uh, and we've talked about this, you know what it is, but you know, how how have you done that in your practice that you might share with the interns? So this is kind of the sharing and teaching element of what you do. And again, we talked about hearing the client's story, but also the client hearing the client's story. And we've talked about the alliance in terms of the common core factors. And this idea of using intuition as before you begin, the antecedent to what the uh, supervisor or intern may do before the session, I think, is helpful because it really sets a positive direction, but it also gets us thinking kind of along where the client's coming from, as we used to say. And then uh, incorporating the therapeutic synchronicity. I gave a couple examples of that. And again, therapeutic rituals that people may uh, develop with the client as, as you go through. I, I found that using the SRS and ORS was helpful because it, it punctuated the beginnings and endings of session, which is kind of in a sense of a, a, a structure that people become used to as you go through uh, the time working with the intern, but also the intern working with clients. And then of course, the extra therapeutic factors are in addition to just uh, meaningful coincidences that may happen for the client, like promotions or other things that are maybe not directly related to therapy. And then always staying focused on holistic practice with body, mind, and spirit kind of connections because we, when we're in a session with a client, we're both in the here and now, 
And we're also in non-local areas in terms of where we go in our thinking and self messages and uh, listening. This knowing sense that we have, which is about intuition as well. We use a lot of things in session that we may not give a lot of thought to. So at this point, I think we'll move then to evidence-based practice, which is the next area that we talked about. So what we looked at in client-centered area was the art of the profession. And now we're looking at the science and evidence-based practice. And so here you'll see on the image, we have the therapeutic methods and techniques that you use, which you're very familiar with. And this idea of managed cares and positions on what we are able to do or not do in terms of, of the guidelines. So that sometimes is a challenge, both in terms of us with the client, but also as time has gone on, there's been a reduction in terms of reimbursement from insurances. I've talked with some private practitioners that now have to see at least half as many more clients to stay at the same income they were at, say six or seven years ago. So not only is the managed abuse affecting the client, but it's also affecting practitioners. And that's a challenge, I think, as we go forward. How do you, at use of self, how do you manage around that sort of playing field as well? And then feedback informed treatment. And uh, Dr. Bucky, would you like to talk a little bit about that and an example you have? George is so gracious. Actually, I asked to talk about this because I think it's so critical to what you do, both as your own practitioner in your own setting, as well as a supervisor with interns. And I come at it, uh, the story I'm about to share with you and the elements in it uh, from the position of someone who was an intern and who was engaging with a supervisor. And granted, this was before I learned anything about feedback informed treatment, but it also goes to show, I think, how critical the supervisory relationship is for an intern. And a particular series of group sessions with the supervisor that four of us shared in an agency. I was always seeking something more genuine, something with more feeling and empathy and instruction in it from my supervisor. She would engage at a superficial level, I felt. And then um, we had some general information, but nothing really that could hone us into someone who could deal with a particular issue with a client the next time and the next time and the next time. In other words, I did not feel there was an opportunity to grow my learned skills that I was acquiring from, especially from the group sessions, but also from the individual sessions. Now, whether that had anything to do with my accepting an invitation to go off and get a PhD, I don't know, but I do rather think that it was an impact statement of sort for me to head toward higher knowledge. And uh, who knows, had it been different, a different experience for me, um, I might be sitting here with LCSW after my name as well. But I just wanted to emphasize how strongly I feel about the ability of you as a supervisor to be a role model, to be a leader, but to also give an opportunity to your interns to engage with you in a very proactive way so that they can move forward, widen their experiences, and solidify their knowledge base to gain more confidence. And of course, that's what they're working toward as a licensed uh, clinician. Thanks, George, for that opportunity. Next, deliberate practice. We've talked a lot about deliberate practice for supervisors and interns, but in this case, I'd like to talk about how the intern may do deliberate practice with the client, which would be uh, various things around uh, role plays. So then moving then to assessment of intern competencies. Competencies is another area that we might wanna be more attentive to. And I'm providing you with some materials, but you may use your own. I mean, I don't know, I couldn't find much out there, but you know, looking at how do you take the knowledge that people have and develop the skills, which is a deliberate practice piece, and then their abilities to do that and reflect on it, which is kind of Paulo Freire's uh, educational process. You take the knowledge, you apply it, and then you reflect on how successful or how it went, which is really kind of what we do as supervisors with interns. Then developing therapeutic boundaries, most important. And by developing the boundaries and beginning to share but not share too much with the client, 
we begin to also offset our, as we were saying earlier, our uh, transference issues as well, and also building more empathy toward the client. If we can share with them uh, issues that we may have overcome that might be uh, associated uh, within reason. And, uh, and so that's an, another judgment thing, but it's important. Then managing the parallel process, we've already been through that in some detail, and risk management, attending to your needs in terms of self and risk management, always being attentive to when you're doing things and what the rationale is. And if you're ever sitting in a courtroom and they're asking you, well, why did you do this with so-and-so? How might you respond in terms of providing the evidence of what supports that? And then I think formative and summative evaluation is also important. I do more with this in the 12-hour workshop, but as you're getting through meeting the various competencies, that would be kind of your, sum, uh, your formative evaluations where you move from that to the next stretch goals. The summative evaluations are more your annual or every six months, depending on how frequent you do those, depending on how frequently you do those. So that would be that area that I would just kind of quickly cover now. And then moving finally to other factors that we are facing in our work. I, I like this concept of therapist is wounded healer. This, this is an interesting concept, but I think it's very important because all of us through life are somehow wounded uh, on a number of levels. And, uh, and I even think there's a scripture, I believe it's in Luke's gospel, where there's something about physician heal thyself. It's an interesting kind of thought that's stuck with me for years. But see, we don't heal our clients, we help facilitate them healing themselves. And I think that, you know, being a wounded healer, we also examine how we've been able to heal through various ways that we can help the client. Basically, we look at the client and try to figure out what, how best we might help them deal with these issues. How might they hear them? What might we have them do? I'm really a big advocate for artwork. You know, I studied mandala symbolism for a while and how it's used in diagnosis. I didn't use it exactly that way because I'm more into metaphors. And I think the metaphors that come in artwork are much deeper than talk therapy and lead sometimes to uncover things that may have been missed over several weeks of talking. So I encourage you to involve the clients in, in, in a useful way with artwork and your use of self and practice in whatever way, way you're able to do so. I also have a student that I work with that does gaming. He was working with adolescents and children and also adults in a, a substance abuse program. And they just love this uh, uh, sphere that he had that you had to get things around this thing to get it into the space where it didn't fall off the track. The, the adults in the group couldn't wait to do that every week when they got together, which was interesting. But he also told me about card games and other things he used with students who had short tempers. And they would, they would address the issues around the temper in the game as the person became frustrated. It was interesting, but he was doing gaming and therapy, which is a growing thing as well. Both his were card games and, and games within the session as opposed to online kinds of things. But there are elements of both that are being used as an example. Then looking at your role as supervisor, you know, educator, advocate, leader, those are also elements of what we do in our supervision uh, with the interns. Of course, the self-care plan we've talked about. And then, you know, awareness of our own personal biases, values, beliefs, limitations, and needs, as well as having the intern become aware of those in context with their therapeutic work. And of course, in the end, trying to figure out what the balance is in terms of how much self-disclosure and how not. But I think if the client is having to do all this exposure, it's helpful if we kind of work with them with some examples. I think it, it brings them to some sort of sense that you're also a real human. And it also helps us become more sensitized that none of us is perfect in this world. And it helps build some compassion for people, particularly around groups that we may have a historical bias with. But I think once we look at people as individuals and humans and try to step into their world, it helps us do some shifting into that direction. And with this, Julia, do you have anything further to add before we close? I just want to say that um, I do have the utmost respect for those of you who are supervisors because you have a tremendous amount of responsibility coupled with the weightiness of that liability factor we've spoken of earlier. But I think the most precious thing you bring and you can ever deliver are the engaged, sensitive, sharing, and competent future clinicians that you are molding 
as a supervisor. I think that is one of the most phenomenal gifts you can give the world at this time. I've often been amazed at George, what I have been able to learn about feedback informed practice. And so I hope that you will embrace some, if not all of those elements to give interns like this person once was an opportunity to both track their needs and their growth simultaneously. And of course, modeling that behavior for your interns is essential as the final touch to those clinicians that you are producing. Thank you so much for your work. Now we will move to the next objective in the CE.